great job, man. Um, I had a question based on the Isaiah 7 passage. So with the word Alma being, you know, kind of a multifaceted word in which, you know, a, a lot of different meanings would come out of it. Uh, do you think it is a relevant, do you, do you think it's a good principle to uh, basically let the way that the New Testament writers quote the passage, do you believe that that would be a, a good way of defining those words in the Hebrew that may have a multifaceted meaning? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think that the old, uh, the New Testament's use of the Old Testament is our best interpreter of the Old Testament, of course. I don't think we would disagree with that. Um, but it extends to more than just uh, interpretations of prophecy. I think it also uh, extends to even meanings of specific words as the holy writers of Scripture were uh, guided by the Holy Spirit not just to use uh, general concepts or general ideas in their head, but to use specific words even at times. And so I think that would uh, be a, a, an excellent way of defining those terms in the, um, in the scriptures. So to <clears throat> shed just a little bit of light on this Isaiah 7 passage, you, first of all, you did a wonderful job, um, really excellent. In Isaiah 7, the house of David is mentioned in verse 2. And in verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. The you is plural, as you pointed out, and it's a reference to the house of David. Um, Ahaz would not be alive to see the fulfillment of this prophecy, but the house of David would. And so this is uh, not only a prophecy of the virgin birth, but a, uh, an extended prophecy that the house of David would survive to see the virgin birth though Ahaz would be dead. But in verse 16, the pronouns shift back to singular. There, and uh, as a matter of fact, the New International Version puts the word but at the beginning of verse 16. So there's a shift being made between verses 15 and 16. And there's two prophecies that are being given here. Verses 14 and 15, are what's called a long-term prophecy. It would be 700 years before this long-term prophecy of the virgin birth would occur. And in order for these prophets to give credibility to their long-term prophecies, they would give short-term prophecies. And when the short-term prophecy was fulfilled, that assured the people that the long-term prophecy would eventually be fulfilled. The short-term prophecy is given in verse 16, before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose the good, the land that you, singular King Ahaz, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both their kings. This child in verse 16 is a different child than the virgin born son of verse 14. The child in verse 16 is Isaiah's son, Shear Jashub, mentioned in verse 3. Isaiah was told to take his son, Shear Jashub, with him and go see King Ahaz. So he takes his little baby son, Shear Jashub, with him. And he gives this long-term prophecy of a virgin having uh, a child. And then his short-term prophecy is before this child that I'm holding right here. Matter of fact, he uses a near demonstrative pronoun, this. And he's not saying before that child way off in the distance is born, the land shall be forsaken of the kings you dread. But before this child that I'm holding in my arms before it is old enough to distinguish between good and evil the countries that you dread will be forsaken of both her uh, both their kings and so that happened within two years both of the kings threatening him Pika and reason were gone they were no longer a threat that short-term prophecy came true, and now the house of David could rest assured that one day the long-term prophecy of the virgin-born son 
would eventually come true. That's helpful. I appreciate it. Thanks, Caleb. That was really good. Um, kind of regarding Ben's question, clearly Matthew is using Isaiah 714 to say this was fulfilled in Christ. So the question becomes, is it direct line prophecy or is it typological fulfillment? So like the Hosea 11, 1 passage is typological and yet it was fulfilled. Hmm. That's why I think the Alma discussion is really important. And the, I was just going to share this for what it's worth. There's a book called The Mother of the Infant King, of which Peter J. Gentry is one of the authors. And that's a quite technical book dealing with Hebrew, but it's making a definitive case that Alma is virgin. It was understood that way, and you don't have to rely on the Septuagint to make that point. And I point that out just to say this further. If you like Kindle books, you can buy it on Kindle today for $3. Now, it's usually a $50 book, and you may not want to spend 50 bucks because it's pretty dense, but at 3 bucks, it's a pretty good investment. What's the name of it? The Mother of the Infant King by Peter J. Gentry and Christopher Christoph Rico. Thank you, Caleb. That's very good. Uh, I just want to make a comment on a question that was asked or a point that was brought up earlier about Matthew's usage you know, of the word virgin as compared to the word used in Isaiah's account. I've got a little paragraph I just want to read. I'm going to use it in my talk this afternoon as well. But I want to go ahead and read it and introduce it because I think it's a great quote. And I think it helps us to understand the importance of the New Testament's interpretation of Old Testament thoughts. This is from a book by James D. Bales called The New Testament Interpretation of Old Testament Prophecies of the Kingdom. If you don't have it, I recommend getting it. It's probably out of print, difficult to get, but it's a great book. But this is what he says. He says, one must expect to find that the New Testament is clearer in its speaking concerning subjects of New Testament period of time than Old Testament references to the New Testament period of time. Now, he uses it especially with kingdom, but I think you can apply it to this word as well. He says, in other words, one would find, one would expect the teaching in the New Testament concerning the Messiah's present kingdom to be easier to grasp and understand than the teaching of the Old Testament on the same subject. One therefore would always accept the New Testament presentation of the application of prophecies instead of what he thinks ought to be the interpretation of prophecies. Now, if he's right, and I think he is, then what Matthew says about that word virgin is the one that we go with. That that word means virgin, not just a young girl, but it means virgin. Regardless of the other nuances of that word, Matthew's usage of it explains the way that it's to be understood. Thanks, Caleb. That was awesome. Really enjoyed that presentation. Um, when uh, back when I went to Egypt in 2019, <clears throat> uh, I thought that the virgin birth would be a point uh, on which I would kind of clash with the Muslims that we encountered, but it's interesting that Muslims generally ag agree, and, and the Quran actually teaches the virgin birth. The Quran teaches that no man touched Mary, but the Spirit of God breathed on her, and that's how Jesus was conceived. And so I thought that was really interesting, and I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on... Uh, engaging with Muslims about the virgin birth uh, and using it in apologetics with Muslims. It's interesting you, you say that. Um, <clears throat> I spoke with a, a classmate, it was I think two or three years ago now, um, I think two years ago. I spoke with a classmate who was a Muslim and um, we, we were discussing back and forth about a, a, different, a few different things. Um, mostly concerning the nature of Christ and his uh, deity. But uh, the first thing we started with, of course, is resurrection and sort of went backwards from there. Um, uh, and we talked about the virgin birth as well. And there was another, like you said, sort of a point of surprise where at the time I had, didn't had no, have any idea as to what uh, he might say about it. But it, I did 
was surprised to find that we had some common ground to stand on. I don't have any really um, advice, any, any advice to give on, on the issue um, other than it's a, it's a good point to start with, maybe. As I said, that was a great job, Caleb. Uh, I was doing something else here. I didn't hear you mention, I was out for the first few minutes of your talk, so maybe you mentioned this, or maybe George did a minute ago. But I think it's important in the Isaiah 7 passage that he begins this, he's having this discussion with Ahaz, and he asked Ahaz to ask for a sign, and Ahaz said, no, I'm not gonna ask for a sign. But then Isaiah says in verse 13, then he said, hear now, O house of David. He is no longer talking to Ahaz. He is talking to the nation when he says, O house of David. And that helps to uh, remove this notion of the fulfillment of this prophecy being in chapter eight uh, with the birth of I can't say his name right now, but that, that big long name. There's a long hush box. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that being a type of Christ, it helps remove it altogether because this is a prophecy to the entire nation, mm -hmm. not just about Ahab. Mm -hmm. George. This is just an advertisement. Um, that book Doug just referenced, New Testament Interpretations of Old Testament Prophecies of the Kingdom by James Bales. You can't buy that book. If you could find it, you'll pay over $100 for it. I'll post it on my website as a PDF file by the end of this week. You go to our website, willofthelord.com. You can download it for free. It has no copyright, and I'll, I'll post it on, uh, on the web. It's got 176 pages to it, so as, if anybody's interested. 